So let me do chapter five overview first. Um, I, I think uh, looking at the chapter, it's, um, I actually don't know why your textbook didn't break up this chapter five into two chapters because it might be the longest chapter. I don't think there's any other chapter that has nine sections in it. So given that it's uh, such a long chapter and we are going to be spending three weeks in it, uh, let me just cover the portion of chapter five that uh, pertains to that pertains to the um, the sections that we uh, are covering this week. That's gonna be the first four sections here, and I think for the first four sections, um, what I cover in the lectures that you can see um, from the modules, chapter five of reading and lectures, part one. Uh, that. Uh, uh, tracks mostly closely. I don't think I'm doing anything out of order. So let me just point out some things that um, that I think are important. Uh, I think you should pay particularly close attention to as you read through the chapter. Um, uh, yeah, and um, we will return to section 5.2 and um, go into discussion of relative le relativity of simultaneity in more depth. So, um, so section 5.1, it's uh, uh, section 5.1 covers the postulate of uh, special relativity. And I think this is um, potentially quite um, new, unusual, um, I think new is maybe the best uh, adjective. Uh, new way to think about uh, physical theories because I think you are used to seeing laws of physics. I think you are used to th seeing things like Coulomb's law. You are used to seeing uh, th various formulas. What many people in this class I think are not quite familiar with is something called um, uh, uh, axiomatic, uh, uh, or <laughs> what is it? Axiomatic mathematics, where you start out with uh, some uh, proposition that can be proved, but you assume they are true in math. They call that axioms. And starting from that, you drive uh, anything else that you need to know. Uh, theorems, so if it's a small, you call it lemma. If it follows right after theorem, you call it corollary. And you might have seen some aspect of that when you took geometry way back when, but I, I think uh, uh, since it's geometry, the proof oriented thinking isn't quite emphasized in mathematics. And the way we cover special relativity kind of falls on that. So we are going to start out with the postulate of special relativity. And those are our two axioms of special relativity. And we drive everything else we need from that. So in section 5.1 is where we cover some of the uh, physical concepts that you uh, may be familiar with already, like inertial frames. That's something that could have been mentioned in physics 4A. Uh, I will say for my own physics foray that I kind of skip over it. <laughs> so, so that's maybe one reason to read through this carefully. And um, and Einstein's the first postulate and second postulate, I think as you look at it, you will kind of see that these are not necessarily new ideas when you read the first postulate. Um, this uh, might even sound familiar to you. This is something that either we were always, um, it's just the spelling out, something that we are always assuming to be true. And it's spelled out because it's that important. And Einstein's a second postulate. I take some time to go over that in the lecture. And um, I, I guess what it boils down to for the purpose of this class is really what it says here. Um, let me kill what it says here. Light travels in a vacuum with the same speed as C. Um, and 
always. It doesn't matter regardless of what's happening. It doesn't matter if the source is moving. It doesn't matter if the observer is moving relative to the source. It doesn't matter if something else is moving. All you have to ensure is that light is traveling in a vacuum because if a light is traveling in a medium, then that, um, that kind of changes things. But once you've uh, confirmed that you are talking about light traveling in a vacuum or something that's close enough to the vacuum, then someone asks you, what is the speed of light? It's uh, always going to be C. And there will be some circumstances where if you, as you apply this postulate literally, you will see, a, uh, you will see either the result or the setup that looks quite unintuitive. And what I want to impress on you, and I take a longer time in lecture to do that, is that um, in special relativity, it's not your intuition that you can rely on. It's this fact, this uh, postulate that you can rely on. And I'll just say it's been, it, postulate is kind of like physical laws in that um, it means it is something that has been extensively tested and we quite strongly believe it is true. Um, the only difference between physical law and postulate is that um, in a kind of logical sense, postulate is the starting place. Whereas the physical law, it is something that you guess based on uh, experimental observations. Um, this, <laughs> yeah. So, so the way we, the way Einstein developed special relativity and the way we cover it, it'll be quite theory heavy. We will, you will see mentions of thought experiments that are quite theoretical way of thinking. And that goes with the character of a special relativity. It's a, a quite elegant theory that <laughs> um, a lot of it, well, the entirety of special relativity is basically derived from this uh, first postulate, principle of relativity, and the second postulate that light always travels at a constant speed of C. Well, in that. And the rest of the sections are really uh, mathematical derivations that follow from those two postulates. And it, it'll take some time. That's why we are going to take three weeks. In this the first two weeks, uh, we will go over the relative theory of simultaneity. And um, so your textbook does cover this. And I guess I will say this much that um, your textbook description, it you know, as you read through it, it might sound weird. <laughs> it might sound, sound unusual. Um, I will just say this much that, um, that your textbook description is correct. There is no mistake there. There's no typos there. I've checked it quite extensively. And uh, in a later bit, we will. I will go over this relative, relativity of simultaneity in more depth, both uh, once with the examples in your textbook and maybe with the additional examples that I hope will uh, illustrate the idea of relativity of simultaneity uh, more thoroughly. If there's one thing that uh, proved to be most uh, significant conceptual hurdle for people, it's a relative deal simultaneity. I think uh, things like time dilation, length contraction, people usually understand that and can apply that fairly well in problem solving and whatnot. Um, but when you run into things like uh, paradoxes, um, usually the mistake people have made relates to relative deal simultaneity. So, so we'll go into this in more depth in the later half of today's virtual class session. Um, the, the next two sections describe some of the um, derivations that you can do. And in fact, we do in lecture <laughs> without referring to more advanced tools. You can do these derivations just to using the two postulates of special relativity. Uh, most importantly, that speed of light is constant. So uh, time dilation is the first one that's uh, the easiest one to do. And this uh, exact setup is what you will see used in the lecture. It's, uh, um, you can basically see this as how the distance that light travels in this reference frame is different from the distance that light travels in this reference frame. And, um, and both uh, in this picture and in this picture, light travels at the same speed, C. And that necessarily means 
something has to give. So before special relativity, what you would have said is that light travels faster here because there's the usual speed that light would have traveled up and down, and you would just add by vector component the 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 horizontal speed of the airplane. And um, so in pre-special relativity, you would get a different speed of light that way. And what we are asking you to hold on to is the second postulate of special relativity, which says that light always travels at C. Here, light travels at C here. Here, light still travels at C. And since the distance it's traveling changes, what must change is the um, so distance changes, what must change is the amount of time that passes. So your textbook uses different symbols to highlight that. This is what we call proper time to denote it with the symbol tau. And this is the time measured in uh, uh, another inertial reference frame that's moving relative to this uh, proper reference frame. And, and uh, so they drive the time dilation and um, and it <laughs> introduced the factor gamma, uh, Lorentz factor, or the relativistic factor. And um, there's a phrase that uh, that will help you kind of help you remember which way gamma goes, because uh, <laughs> uh, most people kind of can remember this formula for gamma: one over square root of one minus v squared over c squared. You see it often enough that you will eventually memorize it. Uh, the kind of mistake that's easy to make is uh, which place gamma goes. Does gamma go on this side or on this side? And the phrase that will help you remember to put gamma on the correct side is this. Moving clocks are slow, or moving, moving clocks are slower. And what that means is if you have a well, this is my moving clock. <laughs> and as it's moving, you can imagine this clock um, ticking down one second or ticking up one second. And as this moves, uh, this gamma has to be set up so that as this moves by one second, the uh, any other clock that's uh, measuring uh, this time, it has to measure longer than a second. So this uh, uh, clock that's moving, it, um, it it runs slower. It appears to run slower. And I kind of trying to emphasize this, uh, which is that special relativistic effects, they are real effect. They are not just something that's apparent. That's why I'm trying not to say moving clock appears slower. They are actually are slower. They are not just appearing slower. Um, so moving clocks are slow. That'll hopefully help you remember where to put gamma on the correct side. And uh, as you do that, one thing to kind of note about gamma is that it's a unitless quantity that's always greater than one because this V goes from zero to C. When it's zero, gamma is one. As it nears C, the denominator gets smaller and smaller, so gamma becomes larger than one. So, so that's time dilation and there are, um, this example is uh, <laughs> famous and <laughs> good example to think through. I think we have some homework questions that relate to this. So do take some time to read it through. Um, and the, the decay of muon is actually a good example. This picture is actually showing uh, something that you will more properly see in the next section length of contraction, because um, this is the proper length of the mountain. It's some height. And in Muon's reference frame, where the mountain is moving, it appears it is contracted. But um, section 5.4 more, yeah, as we'll discuss later, <laughs> section 5.4 will cover length of contraction. So, oh, and uh, I think your, so your textbook covers twin paradox here. Um, We'll handle it in some other place. I want to uh, cover this when we have introduced the tool of space-time diagram, because um, uh, <laughs> yeah. So so we'll come back to this in a, at a later point to, to um, handle this more um, thoroughly and less confusingly, maybe. Um, so section five point four. This is the last section we are covering this week. It covers length of contraction um, and. It's, uh, let's see, do they do the, so 
Yeah, they don't do the same derivation that I do in the lecture. I would really encourage you to look at the derivation. Um, so in the lecture, I do the derivation for the length contraction here. Uh, after deriving time dilation, you can actually use the, uh, the some of the things that you derive in time dilation and use the setup of uh, michelson morley experiment to, to actually uh, set things up to derive length contraction and um, take a look at that because apparently your textbook doesn't. And in the end, the result comes down to this. It uh, comes down to deriving this uh, uh, expression here, um, which is this. You can look at this or with the plugging in gamma, the Lorentz factor from before this. And um, and this L naught is what's called the proper length. It's the length measured in the reference frame of the object where it is at rest. So this is what you might call the object's real length. And in any other reference frame where the object is moving, you measure something different. You measure the contracted length. And you remember that gamma is a unitless number that's bigger than one. So uh, so the phrase that I have to remember where gamma goes in this expression is that moving rulers are short. So if uh, well, if this is my ruler and it's moving, then it has some length in a in its own uh, reference frame where it's at rest. It has a particular length that's the proper length, and as it's moving across, and I try to measure its length, then the length of this thing will be shorter because moving rollers are short. So, um, and as you will see in lecture, these uh, two things, time dilation and length of contraction, they can be derived just straight uh, from the two postulates of special relativity without introducing any new tools. Now, having said that, uh, in the future weeks, in the upcoming, well, next week, what you will see is that you will see uh, me, you will see us introduce a Lorentz transformation because um, these time dilation and length contraction formulas, the thing to remember about them is that they are special situation formulas. They apply to the exact situation that you saw us use here. And when you change those arrangements, um, these two expressions are not generally true. So uh, to handle general special relativistic, relativistic situation, what we will need is the Lorentz transformation and we will introduce them next week. So, so that's for next week and we will, uh, I'll talk over these other sections of chapter five in a future week. Again, I'm not quite sure why <laughs> they didn't break up this into like two different chapters. Uh, so.